All right, so many institutions, universities, research institutions have hard and steadfast rules in terms of the number of publications that they actually need to get in terms of getting one of these jobs, right? So an assistant professor is going to be a lower amount. Uh, maybe it is one or two A publications. Maybe it's 10, depending on the field that you're in. If you're an associate professor, it's going to be more. That's typically when you get tenure. Often you get promotion and tenure at that moment. It depends at different universities, but that's kind of a kind of somewhat of a norm. And then a full professor, you're going to be expected to have a lot of different publications. And so I'm being really squishy with this is because it is extremely unclear with any particular discipline um, in the any particular field in terms of what is determined the right number of publications that you actually need to get to get that academic job. Right. So in some fields, it might be. All you need to do is to have two A journal publications to get an academic job. Well, that's going to seem crazy in other fields because two A's is going to be like, wow, they only did two A's. Um, but, you know, in, in my field, actually, two A's would be really good in terms of the contributions that you gave. And, and it's extraordinary, actually, effort to get two A's in, in strategic management. Um, but, you know, in other fields, it's going to seem like, well, that's dumb. And so why, what is going on here in terms of understanding the number of publications that you actually need for an academic job? There is a lot of different things that are going on behind the scenes. And that's really what I wanted to unpack with this. So it is a big challenge because, you know, the first thing is, is extremely unclear. What is an A journal? Um, there is, there's infinite number of debates that universities go through into determining what is an A journal. And there might be, so in, in my field, it might be called the UT Dallas list, right? So that's one list. But then there's the FT, so Financial Times 40 or 100 list. I can't remember which one it is. Now it's changed. Um, you know, there's all these different lists that are out there. I think the Australians have their own list. And there's all these different lists. And really what it's, it's coming down to is sort of picking out what is an A journal and what does it actually mean to be part of an A journal? Because each journal has its own, uh, you know, whatever you send your papers to, some of them are really easy to get into, like really easy to get into. You just simply have to send in an article and you'll probably get published. Um, and others, it's going to, the rejection rates might be, um, you know, 99% of the articles that are sent there, and I'm not lying, 99% um, of the articles that are sent there are going to be rejected and they're not going to get in. And that's going to be the best people in the world sending their articles to those particular journals. And so it's really difficult to sort of understand which ones are the good ones and the bad ones because um, it's largely a social construction, right? So all of science is very much a social construction. I'm going to get into what, what that is and what I'm talking about here. The other thing is um, it is really unclear to assess what your contribution is to the actual research project, right? So in a lot of different um, circumstances, you could be given um, opportunities to a research project that other people might not necessarily get opportunities to. And the role that you've done on that research project could be a lot less than somebody else that has led a research project and it's all completely their own and um, is put, taking a lot of effort and developed the idea and all that kind of stuff it is going to be substantially different in terms of what the what you've actually done on that. And so it's not clear often in terms of the number of journal articles that you actually need to get a job because people are just really uncertain about you and the ideas that you're generating, right? So good ideas, good research ideas are really difficult to assess. And so how do we actually know whether an idea is actually good or not or a research article is actually good or not? And the reason, the way that we actually know um, whether an idea or a research paper is actually good enough is just looking to see what other people have said about that research article or what they're doing with that research article. And so there's, there's different metrics in terms of the way that we assess those. And all of those are lagging indicators. So what does that mean? So we're looking at how they're cited in the literature, right? So if you get more people that are citing the research article, um, and that's your research, or that's your, your impact, um, or um, impact factors, it's called. Or you, um, you know, another way is to look at lagging indicators, and that's where letters of references, for example, really matter, where people are saying, 
man, this guy had some really, or this girl had some really, guy or girl, um, had some really cool ideas, and we think that they're going to make really big contributions in the future if they just keep doing those kind of things. And that's really the way that, that the assessment of whether somebody is actually good in terms of whether they're actually going to get a job and the number of publications that they actually need um, is looking at these sort of really squishy, squishy metrics of, um, you know, whether somebody is actually doing the right things with their research ideas, right? So the research publications themselves is not necessarily the really big thing. And, the, and it is, it's the currency that we have, but there is a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes in terms of determining whether somebody is actually going to get an academic job and whether they actually have the right number of publications that they actually need. And so there might be wide variances where all you need is one journal. So, so let's say, um, for example, and, and I'm reading the book um, by Walter Isaacson um, about Einstein's biography. And that was it's really interesting, by the way, um, in terms of the, the person behind the scenes, in terms of what you hear. He really struggled in terms of getting a job, right? It took years and years and years. I think nine years he was struggling at it. Might might be even more. Um, to get a job. And, and even when he applied, so even when he wrote the papers and he had, um, I think it was 1905, right? So he had all of these different papers that, that came in um, and they were impressive, right? Like change the field in terms of change physics as we know it, um, came up with the theory of special relativity, um, you know, all these really wonderful things. And even when he went to go apply for jobs, he got rejected. Um, for the jobs that he was applying to because everybody was really uncertain about what was going on with the ideas that he was generating, right? So they were revolutionary. I think a lot of people were beginning or a small cadre or a small group of people were recognizing that those are really cool ideas. But um, at the same time, people, most people were like, well, who is this person, <laughs> right? Uh, we don't really understand who this person is. And they're kind of just, um, you know, is this, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? And so it really uh, was difficult to assess what was going on. And so eventually, you know, he ended up going to Princeton and all that kind of stuff and doing wonderful things. But um, at the time, for many years, uh, people were sort of uncertain about what he was actually doing, right? So the general rule for the number of publications you actually need to get an academic job um, and and there, it's real squishy, right? So you have to really assess that in terms of what this is. But some schools actually will have hard lines um, and it's going to vary from institution to institution, from field to field, where there is a hard line that you need to get. If you have, you know, three publications, you're going to get an assistant professor um, job. But that is like the cutoff. So if you have three um, it doesn't mean that you're going to get it, right? So they, they're looking at other criteria after that, right? So you can have you can have 10, and if you are the type of person that they don't want you to bring aboard, um, they're just, you know, they're, they're not going to look at you in terms of uh, what you're about, right? So here's the general rule in terms of thinking about the number of publications. So the general rule that most people are going to ask themselves, and it's a, it's a group effort, right? When people are going through these jobs, um, um, you know, when they're hiring other people. So when you're hiring somebody for an assistant professor, you, the general rule is to ask um, yourself, is this person going to have a shot at getting tenure if you bring them on to the, the institution? Now, that even that self, that question is going to vary from institution to institution because a lot of institutions will bring you on board knowing that it's virtually impossible to get tenure. Um, and so they're not even going to really, you know, consider whether you're going to get tenure and they're just looking for, well, is this person interesting? Um, and then eventually, and, and that's not a bad thing, right? Because you go to that institution, you're just going to go someplace else and get tenure someplace else. Um, so that's what they're looking for. And they're asking each other and every, so a group of people, so it might be 10 people, they're all thinking, well, is this person having a, a shot at getting tenure? Or do we want to bring them on board? Uh, and those are the important things to think about. And once they sort of have that, they're going to look at, you know, publication records and things like that. And the way that they assess, you know, that's the way they assess where they have a shot at tenure is publication records. The, the um, sort of second thing is, you know, getting to associate professor level or getting promotion and tenure um, is, is the question that they're going to ask themselves is whether this professor it will go on um, and become a full professor and do wonderful things as a full professor. And that's really what they're thinking about is, yes, you know, if we get them tenure, 
um, they're going to be, we're making a big investment in them. It's going to be a million dollar investment. It's kind of like the average in terms of what, uh, you know, in terms of the investment, if you didn't know, you know, associate professor um, is we're going to make this huge investment. Um, you know, if we keep them on board, are they going to, are they going to go do wonderful things and bring the university esteem? And if that's the case, we have this hunch that they're going to do that, then that's great, right? So they look at and assess the number of publications you have, the quality of the publications, who's saying what about that particular person, um, you know, all these kind of judgment calls. And it is very much a judgment call across the entire university and all different stages at the university, they're making that assessment, right? So it's not just one group. And that's a really, that's a good thing, right? That's very democratic that you're going through these different levels of the university and everybody is kind of um, thinking about that. And then the last thing, so if you're becoming a full professor, they're looking at, is this person, does it, do they have enough esteem in academia that they weren't becoming a full professor at your institution, right? So it's like getting into, you know, a really fancy golf club um, or a really fancy, I don't know, diners club, for example, right? Like you actually 